Hear me all right? Um, so yes, um, so I found out at 7 a.m. this morning that Alex had COVID and I've um, been cleaning up ever since. So I've, uh, and, and you have to forgive me, I'm on call for three hospitals at the moment, but um, yeah, look, we'll, we'll see how it all goes. So yeah, look, I, I've only fleetingly looked at these slides, but I'll, I'll do my best to do the talk justice. Firstly, I'd like to um, say thank you to Kim and Michael and uh, public, publicly acknowledge their work uh, with SA Peacock. Um, I'm very, uh, uh, the, the, the database, can, the registry continues to go to, from strength to strength under their leadership, and I'm, um, I'm very grateful for that. So, uh, just flicking through. Um, so, yeah, look, obviously someone's changed the slides. It doesn't say Alex J anymore, but yeah, I, I wear many of the same hats that Alex does. I, um, I'm a practicing urologist at Flinders, as well as in private practice as well. So, um, Sure, thank you. Um, so, what um, what the best line that I I've heard of probably that relates here? I was um, I, I was in a talk with Mark Moyad and Kim probably not, uh, but Kim, Mark Moyad's a urologist from this, from Michigan, I think he was at the time, and he he was very much in the wellness sort of space as well. So he was a professor of urology, but a professor almost of alternative medicine. And the one thing he said, which I've always taken, which I say to a lot of my patients, is that healthy patients with cancer do better than unhealthy patients without cancer. And I think that's resonated with a lot of our patients um, in terms of how they approach um, how they approach their prostate cancer, and certainly how, uh, I mean, and, and that it's a, a very holistic point of view. So. In terms of, this is, a, I guess, a very broad diagram of what um, a person's journey will look like. Um, detection can take a range of um, uh, two different ways, I guess. I mean, the majority of prostate cancer is found via PSA these days. Um, so blood tests by GPs, so screening. But they, obviously there's a small percentage, although much less than there ever was, than there was before, people who are still presenting with symptomatic disease and an even smaller percentage presenting with symptomatic metastatic disease. So obviously from detection you go to diagnosis, which requires a biopsy, um, and then also staging investigations to see how widespread your cancer, or if your cancer is localised or metastatic. And then you, from there you're deciding about treatment options and obviously um, managing the side effects of that. Then moving on to follow-up care and then hopefully uh, once that treatment phase is over, I guess life with, well, you know, l survive, surviving prostate cancer and, um, and what that can, uh, can look like. One of the things I guess that certainly I've found over the last 10 years or so has been, it used to be just you and the patient, but now there are so many more people involved in a, um, in a patient's care, which obviously has, impro has improved their quality of life and how they manage prostate cancer. The PCF, so at uh, Flinders, we have a prostate cancer nurse um, we ha uh, so that's Kerry Santoro, but once upon it, that, she took over from Sally Sara, who was our first prostate cancer nurse, who is actually now the Director of Nursing for Prostate Cancer nationally. So she runs the whole program. And it's been very much built um, on what Sally left us at Flinders, which actually is a fantastic framework for um, looking after our patients. Um, exercise physiologists, particularly patients in androgen deprivation, well uh, recognised now to benefit patients, health physiotherapists, dietitian, nutrition, um, sleep physiologists, psychologists. Uh, again, I think the emotional mental health side of, um, of cancer in general has been under, um, under managed for a long time. So, then we, I guess we move on to this concept of survivorship, which is not just surviving in terms of how you, you know, you, I, I guess what your life expectancy is after your treatment, but how you survive in terms of what your quality of life. And that leads obviously to the supportive care side of things, which is how do, how do we, and when I say we as a te team of healthcare professionals, make your life better from, um, 
from, your pros from prostate cancer. And that takes into account many uh, uh, facets, obviously. We're, we're highly invested in the physical side of things, but the social, emotional, financial, spiritual is, is, amongst, is, is left, we leave, you know, is better dealt with, I think, by a number of people who we work with. And you know, this has been well researched. So this is uh, from an article by some of um, Australia's leading urologists, uh, well, sorry, leading he um, health professionals in prostate cancer. Uh, Mark Frydenberg is a um, is a professor of urology in Melbourne. Um, and these are some quotes. So pro problematically, after prostate cancer diagnosis and treatment, up to 40% of men experience poorer quality of life and satisfaction with life over 10 years. Now, clearly, we can do a lot better than that. Um, even with localised disease, one in five men will experience persistent anxiety and depression one year after treatment. I mean, that is something that I think if we as urologists and health professionals, we, we just don't, we're not good at acknowledging that. And it's definitely something, again, we could improve on. And therefore, survivorship care is therefore crucial in men with prostate cancer. And I, I, working particularly with with Kerry um, at Flinders, I've come to realise much more how important this is in, in taking care of men with prostate cancer. Because, you know, we as the doctors, we're very time poor, we've got lots of patients to see, we just simply don't have the time to deal with this. But the, having a prostate cancer nurse or someone who's just got a bit more time to, to talk to people, um, these issues all do come, come out. So specific issues arriving at each stage can be helped by supportive care from the healthcare team, and you know that alludes to that diagram that we saw before. So a quick run through, I guess broadly, um, detection and diagnosis. Most of the time, as we as I kind of alluded to, it's screening detected, a patient's screening blood test done by a GP, usually annually, biannually. Um, is high, second reading is even still high, so then they get an MRI scan, and then if there's sometimes, and if there's an abnormality, they definitely get a biopsy. If there's no abnormality, they sometimes get a biopsy. Um, so, and, and I guess it's, it, it is an important time for addressing um, issues, how patients feel at that time. I mean, obviously, and I say to my patient, you're taking an absolutely well patient who hadn't had a blood test, and suddenly you're going to tell them they've got cancer. It is a big adjustment for them. Um, so the treatment of localised prostate cancer, there's basically three. Um, but broad, broadly speaking, you either watch them or you treat them with curative intent. Um, so that's the concept of active surveillance, which is um, basically we as urologists certainly recognise, and I think the urological community uh, realise that there were about 10, 15 years ago, there was certainly an over-treatment part of prostate cancer and that men were suffering, probably getting worse outcomes from their side effects than the cancer themselves and the threat of their cancer to their life expectancy. So active surveillance has come, certainly when I was a registrar, has become a much bigger part of our practice now. Surgery still makes up a large part of curative treatment for prostate cancer and so does radiotherapy. In high-risk patients, you may combine that with androgen deprivation as well. Um, and it's, um, the, you know, the, the distinction between surgery, radiotherapy is still, um, you know, something that's a little, sometimes can be a little bit controversial. But again, to say, yeah, the treatment still does involve dealing with mental health aspects, anxiety, depression, and you've also got, you know, physiology side of things, pelvic floor muscles for um, physiotherapy, for incontinence, sexual health diet, all those sorts of things. Obesity and diabetes is becoming much more recognised now with the use of androgen deprivation. When I was, a, when I was younger, you used, used to give these drugs and have no idea, we had no idea about these metabolic effects. So then leading into follow-up in life after prostate cancer treatment, again, recognising that it's not just about PSA surveillance, it's about recognising and dealing with problems that people do take for granted because, again, you're largely dealing with asymptomatic men to start with. So bladder, bladder and bowel problems, sexual problems, incontinence problems. Again, from a, you take a patient who was completely well except for a blood test and you give them all those um, problems as well. There's obviously some anxiety with regular cancer follow-up as well. And then, obviously, if they get a recurrence, you've got to go... You're, you, you, the patient goes on the merry-go-round again. 
Um, a mention of life with advanced prostate cancer. Look, advanced prostate cancer is, uh, is becoming de novo less common, but um, you know, you, again, you, you're dealing with much more conventional cancer treatment with hormonal treatment, which works very well since about the 1940s. We've known this, and chemotherapy just gets better and better, but has, has much, much more uh, taken a much bigger, has, certainly I say to patients, the biggest advancements that we've seen in the last 10 years in prostate cancer have been for advanced prostate cancer. It gets better all the time. Um, survivorship issues we've talked about already and um, we've alluded to most of those things there. So in summary, and I don't know, um, can't, I can't remember how much time I've taken, but look, supportive cares are, services are available um, to help people out with these other facets of dealing with prostate cancer that medical, purely medical staff may struggle to for time and from a time point of view and also from a, um, just a, a, sometimes we're just purely, folk, I guess, much more focused on the prostate cancer side of things. And that takes into account a lot of our health professional colleagues, you know, our prostate cancer nurses, and I do see Kerry there in the audience, um, physiotherapists, exercise physiologists, psychologists, dietitians, sleep health physicians. So please um, speak to you, don't be afraid to to, I guess to speak about these issues, if, you're, if you've got a prostate cancer nurse uh, with you, again, it's some, some um, these nurses are very well trained and, and they know how to access these services and it's all about trying to make your lives better.